Painting a city blue doesn't really change it. The plan is to leave no corner of Coventry untouched by a certain shade of blue for the City of Culture year 2021. But it won't do very much to reduce the city's knife crime or the problem of homelessness. Even rebuilding a whole city doesn't result in spiritual revitalization. A city is more than its buildings and its culture. A city is its people. And Ezra and Nehemiah knew that. In a remarkably short time, the city of Jerusalem had been rebuilt. But if there was to be spiritual revival, then its people must be changed. And the only agent for that kind of change is not a colour, it's not a reconstruction, it's not a change of politics, it's not an injection of cash, it's not an influx of visitors, but it is the Bible, the Word of God. And Nehemiah chapter 8 records a revival that is brought about by the Word of God. Wouldn't it be great? if in our city there was a new demand for the Bible, for Bible reading, for Bible preaching? Wouldn't it be great if the precinct was full of people eager to hear God's Word, asking for it and wanting to change because of it? Now, pagan Persian kings, Cyrus in the first place, Artaxerxes, have enabled this return from exile in Babylon. But it's really because God has been with his people. It's another escape story. They've come back to their promised land. Jerusalem had become a wilderness of rubble, but now it's a safe haven again. But more is needed, and its godly leaders know it. So if you turn back for a moment to page 393, that'll take you to the previous book, the book of Ezra, closely connected with this one, page 393, in chapter 7 and verse 10, it tells us there that Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Now, Ezra was no armchair theologian. He wanted not only to study God's word, but he wanted to do it. He wanted to teach it, and he wanted to see it obeyed. And Ezra has been taking a back seat in in recent days in Jerusalem. But now, in chapter 8 in Nehemiah, he comes out of retirement. And together, he and Nehemiah have supervised the erection of a large wooden platform in one of the public squares of the city, not in the temple grounds. Because the word of God must now be taken out to the people. In Proverbs 1, we're told that wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the markets. She raises her voice at the head of the noisy street. She cries out at the entrance of the city gates. She speaks. And that's what's happening here. Wisdom is calling out in the city. What a blessing it is when the word of God is heard in the public square. Not only in church, but in the public square. The people listening to it respectfully, attentively, obediently. What repentance there was on this day and what joy. So we're going to look at three things. And the first is the need for God's word. Hunger for the word of God is a vital step towards revival. It must have been a very impressive sight, don't you think? That high wooden platform, and on it some kind of desk, no doubt, uh, where uh, you could read from the the scrolls. They would be quite large, these scrolls, and they would be unrolled one by one, uh, quite difficult to handle. And for a Bible reading that was going to go on from early morning until noon, Ezra would need some assistance, wouldn't he? And 13 men, we're told, were given their names, stood with him on the platform. All those spiritual leaders of Israel were saying quite publicly that they were coming under the word of God, that they accepted its authority, that they submitted to it. They assisted and enabled the reading. What a blessing it is when spiritual leaders publicly accept 
the authority of the Bible. When the elders of a church say, this is our standards, we all believe the word of God. We all submit to it. What a change would take place in our city if all its church leaders would say that. That would be a great thing to pray for, wouldn't it? And what a change in our country if all, its, it, it, all the church's bishops and archbishops would say, we believe the Bible. Wouldn't that make a difference? Because it's God's word. It's God's revelation of himself. If they would say, we're going to preach its gospel, its good news. We're going to believe what it says about heaven and hell and grace and the sanctity of life and morality and gender. It's God's word on these very things. We're going to read it out loud. We're going to hear God's voice on these matters. But the need wasn't only felt among the leaders of the people, it was also felt, wasn't it, among the people themselves because the Holy Spirit was at work. And when the Holy Spirit is at work, the people will be moved by hunger and thirst for God's word. And the, the people were united here in wanting it, weren't they? Chapter 8, verse 1, all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Something drew them. It doesn't seem to be uh, very much organized, but they all just came as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told, they told Ezra the scribe. It came from them, didn't it? They, they wanted it. They asked for it. In Proverbs chapter 30, the wise man says, feed me with the food that is needful for me. And there's a lot today about healthy eating. But even more, we need healthy spiritual food, don't we? And it's very good when there's a demand for it. And in churches where there is the reading and the preaching and the believing of the Bible, it is, you know, essentially because people are asking for that. It's here in this church because the people of this church are asking for Bible teaching. And ultimately, it's the people, isn't it, that appoint the pastors and the elders. It comes from them. Spiritually hungry people want pastors and elders who will bring them the food and feed them with the food of the Word of God. Let's hear it, they're saying. Give it to us. We want to feed on what's good for our souls and what's good for our community. We want to know what's going to build us up, what's going to help us live for God, what's going to help to change us for good. And I hope that's what you're saying really this evening as you come here to church. We want the word of God. So this teaching isn't imposed on you, is it? It's not a sort of an authoritarian thing. It's not something that uh, you have it because you asked for it. So it was in Jerusalem, the Bible was right at the center of a renewed experience of worship. People use that term worship in some churches these days just to mean the singing. Uh, but that's, that's far from a full-orbed biblical view of worship, uh, which includes the, the, the reading, the preaching, the meditation on the Word of God. But they didn't worship the Bible. You know, in a, in a Sikh temple called the Gurdwara, the holy book itself is kind of venerated it's treated as if it was a person. It's actually called the guru. The guru grants. Treated as a person. And while it's being read, a kind of feathery wand is waved over it to protect it from impurities. And then it's put to bed at night, quite literally. The book is put to bed at night. Now, we're not like that with the Bible, are we? We, we respect the Bible. We love our Bibles. But we don't worship the book itself. We recognize its di divine origin as they do here because it's described as the book of the law of Moses. Moses was the mediator of it, but it's very clear in verse 1 that God is the commander of it. Uh, they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. It was a book of Moses, but God had commanded it. In verse 5 we're told that when Ezra opened the scroll 
Everyone stood up. That must have been very impressive, wasn't it? Thousands of people together hearing the word of God and they all stood up. In some churches today, the people do stand for the Bible reading. But the important thing is not so much whether we stand or whether we sit, but that we do recognize the Bible reading for what it is. The public reading of the Bible, you know, is an essential part of our worship. It isn't to be done casually. It's not to be done carelessly. It's not a time for us to switch off or to be doing something else. We should give it our full attention. We should be praying, Lord, please speak to me from your word today. It is your word. And here the people stand and the word of God is read and God himself is worshipped. Verse 6, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. That's worship. And that's worship in response to the word of God. The need of God's word. Do we recognize that? The second thing is the clarity of God's word. The clarity of God's word. There's a, a strong emphasis in Nehemiah chapter 8 on God's word being able to be understood, isn't there? I expect you notice that in the reading. The Apostle Paul said, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. God has given us his word in a form that is intelligible to us. He wants us to be able to read it and to understand it. How thankful we should be tonight both for the preservation and the translation of Scripture. How thankful we should be for those who have labored for us and sacrificed for us so that we can read the Bible today in our own mother tongue. Now, to say that the Bible is clear doesn't mean to say that it's easy. It doesn't mean to say that everything is handed on to us on a plate. We need to grow in our understanding of the Bible and in our appetite for it. The Bereans, you may remember in the New Testament, they were wise because they searched the Scripture. They went in deep. They worked at it. They needed someone to explain it, like the African reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah in the desert, and Philip caught up with him and preached Jesus Christ to him out of that Old Testament passage of Scripture. We do need help. We need help with understanding the Bible. So those who read it, have the responsibility to read it publicly in our worship services, must do it in a way that makes the meaning clear. That's very important. Uh, so in, in verse 8 of our chapter, it, it, it says so. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly. They read clearly. Uh, in the NKJV, it says distinctly. And in the footnote here in our Bibles, it says, with interpretation or paragraph by paragraph. They read it in a way that was accessible to the people, a way that people could digest. Manageable chunks of text were read, not unmanageable chunks of text. They had to pass the word of God on in a clear way. But on this great day in Jerusalem, there wasn't only the extensive reading of the Word of God, there was also explanation. There was something like preaching, wasn't there? Because verse 8 also says that they gave the meaning. They gave the meaning. And that's essentially what preaching is, isn't it? Very simply, preaching is giving the meaning of the Word of God. It's expounding it. It's showing how it applies to us. 
Paul's instruction to Timothy in Ephesus was, preach the word. That's your job, Timothy. That's what you've got to do. It's a simple three-word job description. Preach the word. And then again he says, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. So we learn from this passage that in addition to the 13 men who stood on the platform with Ezra, 13 Levites are also named, aren't they, in verse 7. And these Levites had a different function. It seems as if they moved among the people. They were helping the people to understand the law. It seems as if there were pauses in the reading, and at that, that those times, these men moved among the crowd to answer questions and further explain the word that had been read. Verse 7 tells us that the people remained in their places, and that does seem to imply that the Levites were moving among them when there was a pause in the reading, explaining it to them. It was important that the word of God was not only read, but that it was also explained. It's interesting just to notice that children of a certain age, an age to understand at least some of the reading and some of the preaching, they were present. It was a huge congregation. It was a very long service, wasn't it? I wonder how we would cope with that. Early morning till, till noon, a very long service. There were no doubt some breaks in what went on, but verse, verse 3 tells us quite definitely... Uh, that uh, in the pre he read it, he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. See this emphasis on clarity. So, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the children, you know, and the children coming under the word of God. Children can and do absorb a lot much more than we may think. And we're not to ignore them, but we're to ensure that they understand as much as they can. And that's part of the preacher's responsibility. So if you think the preacher's being too simple, which they, preachers very rarely are, uh, then think of the 12-year-olds and the preacher's responsibility to make God's word understandable to people who are 12 years old and a bit younger, and certainly a bit older. But it's good for children to sit under the word of God. And it's good for the parents to show what God's word means to them. You parents, you Christian parents, you love your Bible, don't you? You love the word of God. You want your children to love it too. You want them to know it and to understand it. You want them to know that you submit to it, that you want to obey it. You see, we're to make the Bible's teaching clearly known in a way that is appropriate to the understanding of all who hear it. What a scandal it was in this country, wasn't it? When the Bible was only read, read in Latin. It went on for decades. By the Bible changed to, to the pulpit of the church and only read by the priest in Latin by some kind of religious professional. That's not God's will for his word, is it? What joy it brings, doesn't it? What joy when the Bible is clearly read and explained by people who do truly believe it. I hope that whatever you may think about the quality of the preaching in this church, and you may have some preachers that you prefer to others, I hope that you always realize that the people who bring you God's word in this church really believe it. They believe the word of God, and that's a tremendous blessing in the church. Pray to God that that may be retained amongst us in the years ahead. As Stephen pointed out, it brings great joy. Verse 12, all the people went on their way. This is after the reading of the word, to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The rejoicing came out of the fact that they understood God's words. 
So the need for God's word, the clarity of God's word, and thirdly, response to God's words. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we have a platform, a pulpit, we have public reading, we have clear explanation of it, and we have results. And I'm calling this sorrow and joy in the public square. Sorrow and joy in the public square. So the first response to God's word is repentance. Repentance. As God's word was read, you know, people were convicted. I wonder whether that's ever happened to you from God's word. It's touched your heart. It's gone deeper than your mind and your intellect. It's convicted your life. They realized that they had neglected God's word, that they had not obeyed it, that their lifestyles were, uh, were exposed by God's word. Their sin was exposed. And verse 9 tells us that all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. All the people wept. Now, I arrived in church uh, this morning at about um, 10.45, I guess it was, just at the end of the um, first service and in the interval between that and the 11.30 service. There was a tremendous buzz, people sort of chatting and talking (coughs) and getting on well with one another. But it would have been very interesting, a different kind of experience if I'd come in and found everybody crying, wouldn't it? And the law of God was, um, was, was read this morning, wasn't it, in church? And it was preached on as well. And an appropriate response to the preaching of God's word is, to, is repentance, isn't it? We were challenged about that very point uh, this morning. It would be a, a good thing, wouldn't it, if there was a... If, if, there was, if there was more impact of the word of God in our, in our hearts and in, in our lives. I'm not suggesting at all that we should sort of try and make this happen, but just to, just to notice that um, but it, it, it happened here. God's word was read and the people wept. Uh, it was as if they were hearing God's law for the very first time, and it's good when God's word comes to us with that kind of impact, like it did on Mount Sinai when God spoke the Ten Commandments from the fire on the mountaintop, and the people responded in humble commitments. It would be so good, wouldn't it, if this uh, preaching series on a Sunday morning on the Ten Commandments would result not only in us be, in being taught and instructed, but also in true repentance as we hear again the word of God. The 17th century preacher, William Bridge, described the Bible as a looking glass. Using a mirror, we see three things. We see the glass itself, and the the Bible is a testimony to itself and to God himself. And then when we look into a mirror, of course, we see ourselves, our own image in the glass. And as we do that, our sin is exposed to us as we look in the mirror of God's word. It exposes our spiritual need. It shows us our sinfulness. Has that happened to you? But then thirdly, as we look into a mirror, we see things behind us, don't we? Things around us, perhaps other people in the room or other objects in in the room. Uh, And uh, so the word of God exposes the state of our culture as well, doesn't it? our surroundings, our society. It shows to us the need for change. And we do need change. But we need the kind of change that's brought about by God's word. And it's a real turning point in any community when God's word softens our hearts. When God's word brings us to repent. You know, repentance and faith go together. You can't separate them. And so it is here that true repentance very quickly turns into joy. It's meant to. True repentance quickly turns into joy. So the first response is repentance and the second response is joy. Despite the seriousness of their sin, the people were urged to dry their tears, weren't they? You know, the Bible not only condemns sin, it provides the remedy for sin. 
so wonderfully in Jesus Christ, our great Savior, who, if you'd put your trust in him, will find that your sin is forgiven and that you are right with God simply by the grace of God and not by your goodness or works that you may do. And the Bible tells us, you know, that there's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. So these things are joined together, repentance and joy. And at this time when God's word is heard and his worship is reinstated, it is a time for joy. The word comes in convicting power, but it's not a time for gloom. It's reason to celebrate when God's word is rediscovered and reapplied. And one specific thing that came with convicting power to the crowd gathered by the Watergate was the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But it was due right then, in the seventh month, right as they were gathering. And some aspects of that festival had long been neglected. And now they hear the word of God, they want to put things right. And obedience, obedience leads them away from weeping into joyful action. It's a time to make great rejoicing, as it says in verse 12. You know, there are some Christians who seem to think that holiness is best expressed in a somber kind of a way. Holiness and kind of sobriety are the things that go best together. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, it's holiness and joy. Holiness and joy go hand in hand. And so we have this lovely verse in verse 10. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I guess you know that verse. I guess it's been a comfort to you many, many times. Do not be grieved. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I wonder how you read it. Are you reading it tonight as, as joy, as a gift that comes to us from God? Which, it, of course, it is. Or are you reading it as the joy of the Lord himself? I think it's both. But I want just to concentrate more on the second emphasis. You see, some people are joyful people, aren't they? We know them as joyful people. Their joy is infectious. But God is the joyful God. You do know that about God, don't you? That he is joyful. In his presence is fullness of joy. In the prophecy of Zephaniah, God says to his people, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Listen, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Do you think of God singing loudly? He does. He rejoices over his people. It's an amazing picture, isn't it? God singing, singing with joy. God rejoicing over his people. It was happening right there in Nehemiah 8. The Lord's joy it had moved Cyrus to allow them to return to the land. It's the Lord's joy to save and protect and restore his his people. His joy is their stronghold. Yes, they have been weeping over their sin, but the very reason they are here back in Jerusalem right now with a restored temple and restored worship is because of the good pleasure of their God, because of the hand of their God upon them. God is joyfully for his people. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And you know, it's that it's most clear in the gospel, isn't it? In the good news of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And what did Jesus say to his disciples? It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He gives it to you. It's his pleasure to do it. He loves to do it. He loves to be gracious to us. He loves to give us Jesus. He loves to show us the way of salvation. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God takes delight in his people. He takes delight even in this little assembly here this evening. 
because he loves his people. The response of sorrow, the response of joy. And then we see the response of obedience. Out of the repentance and out of the joy comes obedience. When you truly do receive the word of God, you know, you submit to it. People who are not Christians don't understand this. They don't understand why it is that the Christians just believe the, what the Bible says. Why do Christians just believe what the Bible says? Because at a very deep level in their hearts, God has implanted a new principle of spiritual life in which they submit to God. They submit to him. And when you submit to God, be still and know that I am God, God says in his word, doesn't he? Be still and know that I am God. When at a deep level you really submit to God in your heart, then you do submit your intellect and everything that you are to his word as well. It doesn't mean to say you understand, you've grasped the whole thing. Of course you haven't. It takes a lifetime, more than a lifetime. But you do submit at a very deep level in your life to the word of God. And that's a great thing when that happens. And out of that submission comes obedience and change. And it did here with regard to the Feast of Tabernacles. One particular aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles had been neglected, and that was the building of what our translation calls booths. They were sort of like a tent, really, a temporary structure or shelter uh, that was made out of uh, like a, a canopy of, of branches, tree branches. So you could always see the sky between them. It wasn't a sort of solid structure. It, it was like camping out. And uh, this Feast of Tabernacles that the, the Jews were to celebrate every year was to remind them of the way uh, of, the, of the desert journey, of the time when they were out there in the, in the wilderness. And they didn't have a permanent land. They didn't have permanent homes. And, and, and they, they, they were sort of camp, camping out. And during that time especially, they were absolutely dependent on God. They were in a hostile environment. There were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a hostile desert. How were they going to survive? How were they going to get through? They depended entirely on God's provision. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, every year, they remembered it. They were meant to. They were meant to call it to mind how God had wonderfully provided. There was a manna from heaven. There were the quails. There was the water from the rock. Then when enemies came up against them, they were defended. There was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire that went before them. They were wonderfully provided for. If they had known the hymn as sovereign protector I have, unseen yet forever at hand, then they would have sung it, wouldn't they? They would have sung it. And now they're convicted. They hear what the word of God says about what they should do on the fe Feast of Tabernacles. And shortly after this public reading and explanation of the word of God, something happened in the city of Jerusalem, the, new, the newly rebuilt city of Jerusalem. Do you know what happened? There was a shanty town appeared suddenly overnight a shanty town appeared all these structures all these booths in every jewish household on the rooftops in the courtyards in the gardens perched all over the place precariously and people were camping out in these temporary shelters made out of myrtle and olive branches and branches of other types of wood. They must have had fun making them, don't you think? Must have had fun making them. I guess the children were involved. And then for the whole family to camp out there and to live under the stars for a few days, to look up through the, through the canopy of, of, of branches and of leaves and to think about their God, their God who had provided for them, the God who had led them through the wilderness, the God who had given the manna and the, the water from the rock. 
And they would tell the stories. The parents would tell the children the stories of what happened and how wonderful their God is and how he had provided for them through all that wilderness journey. And this had been neglected in Israel. They'd forgotten to do it. They hadn't, they'd, they'd had some kind of nominal of observation of the Feast of Tabernacles, but they hadn't done this thing, not for years. They hadn't been able to, I suppose, when they were in, in exile, but now it's reinstated. And it was a time of tremendous joy. Tremendous joy. You know, almost a sort of like a Christmas feel to it. Like, you know, we have parties and get the families together and go over the stories and so on, don't we, at Christmas time. And that's what they did on the Feast of Tabernacles. And that was part of the, the great joy. And they were, they were joyful because at last they were, they were celebrating God's, God's word and they were, they were obeying God's words. And it was all about the faithfulness of the living God, that the Lord who has provided in the past will provide. And you know that, don't you? That the God who has provided for you, he will bring you through. He will provide in the future. You know, Christians today, we don't keep the Feast of Tabernacles, do we? But we do, surely we do, constantly remember and give God the thanks with joy for the way in which he's provided for us, our great protector and provider. And especially in the gospel, the Lord will provide. He provides the substitute. He provides the saviour. He provides the redeemer. And Having given us Christ, he freely gives us all things that we need in Christ. Last Sunday evening, I think it was, we were thinking about John 1.14, weren't we? The Word was made flesh, and the Word is tabernacled. There's the Feast of Tabernacles in the New Testament in Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. The Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory. Have you seen it? Have you caught a glimpse of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth in the provision of a Savior, and you receive him tonight with repentance and with faith and with sorrow and with joy, and you say with the psalmist in response to what you see of him, I will run in the way of your commandments. I will launch out. Do you want to launch out? as a follower of Jesus? Do you want to be an obedient disciple of Christ because of his great love for you? Let's therefore keep hold as a church, brothers and sisters, let's keep hold of this vision to preach the Bible and to preach Jesus in our city, where we can in the public square, and let's be praying that at last there may be a turning of people's hearts to God. Be assured that if that happens, there will be both sorrow and there will be joy. And it would be wonderful to see it in the public square, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, what is needed today is not a new manifesto of new politicians but it's the old path of the Bible. God's word, revelation, made known to us. But that seems a long way off, doesn't it? It seems a pipe dream, really. But with God, nothing is impossible, is it? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. But in the meantime, let me just ask you personally, do you know the joy of the Lord? Do you? I can see some, some heads nodding. That's great, isn't it? You do know the joy of the Lord. Is that the strength, really, the core of your life? 
Is Jesus Christ your stronghold? Your rock? Your firm place of safety? Do you believe his word and receive it in your hearts? You know, however it is that other people are responding or not responding, let's be sure that we receive the word of God in an honest heart, both with sorrow and with joy, both with rejoicing and with trembling. May God bless his word.